What do we owe this great pleasure? Well, the fact that uh, this great church here supports the great work that the Browns are doing over in Cuenca. And so they're going to be with us all day today. Uh, Rusty will be presenting a lesson tonight, and I hope that you'll be here for that. And also, I hope you'll stay around afterwards, uh, after church this morning. We have a meal that we're going to have together and get a chance to meet the Browns. This is our adopted family that we love to see come to Abilene every so often. And uh, hopefully you'll make them feel welcome and get to know them a little bit. And hopefully you'll let us make you feel welcome if you're visiting with us. You know, we're uh, in a series called DNA. We're talking about what makes us, us. And this morning we're looking at fellowship. It reminds me of the story of the family that was going to the movies. And the little boy wanted some popcorn. And so the dad gives the little boy some money and says, go get in line, get popcorn, and we'll go get seats. Well, getting the popcorn took a little longer than the boy expected. And so when he walked into the theater, the movie had already started and it was pitch black. He couldn't find his parents. He's walking up and down the aisles, but he can't see anything. And so finally, in desperation and frustration, he cries out, does anyone here recognize me? And unfortunately, I think sometimes people walk into church maybe feeling like that little boy, maybe disconnected, lost. Maybe they're asking within themselves, does anyone here recognize me? And unfortunately, sometimes church can be like a movie theater. You file in, you sit down, you look at the back of somebody's head, you watch the show, and then you file out, and that's about it. Obviously, I don't have to tell you, that's not the depiction of church that we see in Scripture. Remember this little illustration? This is the church. This is the steeple. Open it up and see all the people. Not exactly accurate, is it? What it should be is, this is the church building. This is the steeple on the church building. Open it up and see the church. Not quite as catchy, but definitely more accurate, right? But unless and until we understand that the church is not a building, but is people, unless and until we comprehend that the church is not something you go to, but something you are, we're never going to fully appreciate the way God designed it, and we're never going to fully function the way He intended. The way people within the church see the church determines how people outside of the church see the church. A word that is often associated with church is the term fellowship. What does fellowship mean? Well, it's Latin for potluck, right? (laughs) Not exactly, but that's what we think of when we think of fellowship. We think of casseroles and card games and conversation, but there's so much more to it than that, right? What we have to understand is that fellowship is not something you do. Fellowship is something you have. And I realize that if you're a note taker, some of the stuff that we're going to talk about this morning in line with fellowship, you've probably heard before. I think anytime we talk about a certain topic relative to the church and our own well-being and function as the church, there's some things you just got to reiterate. So this is not a complete rerun this morning, but there are some things that you will recognize because we've talked about it before when we talk about fellowship and being together as the body of Christ. When I was younger, I had a friend that my parents didn't like me hanging around. Uh, he was fun-loving. He was carefree. He was obnoxious. Uh, he was a rebel with the cause. Uh, that cause was to obey as few rules as possible. And my parents felt that if only somebody would beat the tar out of him, he would straighten up. And my dad was more than willing to take on the task, if not for the whole CPS prison time thing. But on the rare occasion that my parents would let me hang out with this young man, my mom would always ask me a series of questions. Where are you going? Who else is going to be there? What time will you be home? She always asked those questions, no matter where I went, but she particularly was interested in where I was going, who I was going to be with, what time I was going to be home when I was with this young man, because she knew that me hanging out with him by ourselves was probably not the best idea. And it never failed that when I would get that rare occasion to hang out with him, I would come home and my mother would say something like, I can always tell 
when you've been with so-and-so. Apparently, he rubbed off on me. Apparently, I took on his attitude and maybe his actions to some degree. But it reiterates a point that I think is important for us that we can't miss, and that is that our relationships define us to a large degree. Our associations make us. Our relationships say a lot about us. You know, there was one evening where this friend decided that it was a good idea to throw eggs at cars. And he hit a particular car that came to a screeching halt and chased us down, and we got in some serious trouble. I never threw an egg. I didn't want to throw eggs. But you ever heard of guilt by association? Yeah, I was a victim of that because of who I was hanging around with. So who we are with says something about us. Our associations speak volumes. They matter probably more than we would like to admit. So fellowship is about relationship. We are relational beings, which makes perfect sense because God is a relational God, right? So it makes perfect sense that he would set it up this way. The Bible speaks of fellowship as a two-dimensional affair. You have the vertical which is our relationship with God, and you have the horizontal, which is our relationship with other people. And the vertical informs the horizontal. It sets the precedent, right? The vertical provides the organization, the configuration, and the layout of the horizontal, something that John stresses over and over again in 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him. And testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. The vertical plane presupposes, excuse me, the horizontal plane presupposes the vertical for its very existence. Who we are as the body of Christ is predicated upon our connection to the head, right? The vertical informs the horizontal. You tired of me saying that yet? One more time. There has to be a vertical in order for there to be a horizontal. No connection to the head makes the connection to others useless, right? Hear John's words again, this time in 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was revealed, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship means fellowship. And I realize that's probably not a word, but I thought it sounded cute, so I threw it in there. <laughs> fellowship begins with discipleship. It begins with fellowship. You are defined by your relationship with God, first and foremost, and that relationship defines all other relationships. So if you have bad blood between you and a brother or sister in Christ, you need to fix that. If maybe you are harboring bitterness and anger and hatred in your heart, it says something not just about your horizontal relationships, but first and foremost, it says something about your vertical relationship. If you are sitting in the auditorium this morning and you have beef with someone else who is sitting in the auditorium this morning, that speaks volumes about your relationship with God. It's not so much the relationship with other people, although that's important, but it starts with your connection to the head. And every relationship problem you have in the horizontal points to a relationship problem 
in the vertical. Every barrier to love in our horizontal relationships is a reflection of a problem with love in the vertical relationship. So don't fool yourself into thinking that the vertical can be straight while the horizontal is crooked. It doesn't work that way. Notice Matthew chapter 5 and what Jesus says. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the, and, and go to, before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. The implication is clear. There is nothing more important than being right with God and being right with your fellow man. So much so that you can't even worship properly. What's more important than worship, right? Well, being right with your fellow man. It's so important that you fix it before you even bring your offering. My worship of the divine cannot be right until my less divine relationships are right. John said it this way. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God for whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must love his brother and sister also. Is this not the the two greatest commandments, just stated a little differently? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The vertical and the horizontal, that's what it's all about, right? It's 2D discipleship. It's vertical. It's horizontal living. It's relational living. It's called being a Jesus follower. It's you connected to God and therefore connected to other people. Or you look at it like this. So you have a diagram of the cross. And obviously, the up and down, the vertical is your relationship with God. And the horizontal represents your relationship with other people. But right here in the middle where the two cross, that's where life is lived, right? That is life on life. That is the epicenter of fellowship. The fact that you are connected to God and connected with other people. That's where life is lived. And that's where fellowship happens. You look up and you look around. You see God in the vertical and you see other people in the horizontal. And because you're connected to the head, you see see Jesus in everybody, right? You see people differently. This isn't about casseroles, thank goodness, because you know I don't really like casseroles. Fellowship is about something way deeper than coffee and casual conversation. It's about fellowship. It's about letting the up and down determine the left and the right. It's about loving what God loves. Let me introduce you to somebody. You probably know who this is. This is Coach K. And the reason why he's called Coach K is because his last name has like 10 consonants in a row in it, and it's hard to pronounce. Spell check was going crazy when I put it in my notes. This is Mike Krzyzewski, and I don't know if you like him. I don't know if you like Duke basketball, but whether you like him or not, you cannot argue the fact that he is the winningest coach in NCAA basketball. He has been one of the most successful, if not the most successful, basketball coach of all time. He has won five national championships, been to 12 Final Fours, so he's got the credibility. But before the March Madness Tournament in 2015. Coach K handed a basketball and a Sharpie to every one of his players. And he asked them to take that marker and on their basketball, write the names of all the people who helped them get to where they were. Teachers, coaches, parents, bus driver, whoever it is. All the people who have influenced you and made you who you are and helped you get to this point. And then he said, I want you to carry that basketball with you everywhere we go during this tournament. Well, they won the 2015 National Championship. And I doubt that Coach K meant for this to be a spiritual uh, illustration. But it really is, right? None of us got here on our own. Yes, you may have sat down and studied the Bible on your own and realized that you needed to be baptized, but more than likely, you became a Christian because of another Christian, right? That's how it typically works. And you are here this morning because of other Christians. You are benefiting from other Christians. You see, in a very real sense, we're a team. At the base foundation of it all, we're a team because a team is defined as a collection of individuals united in a common goal. That's what we are. We are a team united in a common goal. And what's the goal? Same as Coach K, to win, right? It's just 
winning and losing takes on an eternal perspective here, which makes it mean a whole lot more. But we can't win without each other. God never intended for Christianity to be practiced on an island. He never intended for us to be Lone Ranger Christians. He obviously meant for us to work as a team in kingdom work. It's God's people working together with God and working with one another to advance the kingdom. That's what fellowship is. Look with me at Philippians chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always offering prayer with joy and by every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. Philippians is an essay on fellowship. Paul uses the word koinonia a lot. And this Greek word means association, it means communion, it means participation. But Paul emphasizes an aspect of fellowship here that I, I don't know that we always think about. He talks about fellowship as a partnership. And that's really what it is. That's definitely what we're doing here. We're in partnership with God and with each other to advance the kingdom. Paul talks about those who were partnering with him financially and those who partnered with him physically. There were those who labored with him for the gospel, people like Timothy and Epaphroditus. But he also talks about those who contributed monetarily in partnering with him to further the gospel. Do you see what all this means? The implication is clear. That every time you contribute to the work of the church here at Oldham Lane, when you drop your money in the collection box, or when you give of your time and energy to the work of the church here, you are partnering with God and partnering with the saints here to further the kingdom. Every time you contribute monetarily to the work in Ecuador, you are partnering with the Browns to spread the gospel there. If you grade papers for World Bible School, you are partnering with God and partnering with fellow Christians to advance the kingdom. You see what we're getting at? You know, some people go and they, they live in the remotest parts of the world and they, they give millions of dollars to build schools and, and orphanages. There's people who live in, in Africa and in Siberia. And we need those people. And I'm grateful for those people. But we tend to think in grandiose terms when it comes to, to spreading the gospel and advancing the kingdom. No, you're partnering with God. Every time you pray for me, every time you pray for the elders here or the deacons here or for this church, you're partnering with God and the saints here to further the kingdom. Every time you contribute in some way, you're partnering with God and the fellow Christians here. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? It's not always about millions of dollars or doing grandiose things. It's, it's as simple as praying, which means that we can all do something, right? Maybe we can't all contribute large sums of money, but we can all do something, right? We can pray. We can, we can labor. We can volunteer. In fact, we all should be doing something because fellowship equals partnership. You were not saved to sit. You were saved to serve. But Paul emphasizes uh, emphasizes another aspect of fellowship as well. Notice what he says in chapter 2 of Philippians, starting in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So God's people have fellowship with the Holy Spirit our participation in the Spirit, as Paul puts it, is the basis for our oneness. We are to be of one mind and one heart and, as we are united in one Spirit. The Spirit of God was partnering with the church in Philippi to make the Philippian Christians to be more righteous, more godly, to help them in their work of spreading the gospel. The Spirit was at work in their lives. 
to make them more intent in shining their big lights and, and bringing glory to God. Or as verse 13 states it, for it is God who is at work in you both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. So not only do we partner with God, not only do we partner with Jesus Christ, we partner with his spirit. The Great Commission is where we partner with, with God, with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus, with each other as we spread the gospel where we maintain our focus on the things that make for righteousness. Paul mentions another type of fellowship, one that I know we don't always think of when we think of the term. It's found in chapter 3, starting in verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as lost because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The fellowship of his sufferings. Paul felt as though his suffering for the gospel brought him closer to Jesus. He felt like that suffering had a very real purpose and was a very real ministry for him in his life. It brought him closer to Jesus. It made him more like Jesus. It prepared him for eternity. And when the people of Philippi sent Paul a, a, a gift while he was in prison, they were, they were partnering with him in his trouble they were partnering with him and participating in his suffering as they partnered with him in his mission as he, as he sacrificed, and they sacrificed of their own means. Do you remember when Jesus prayed for fellowship? It's found in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for oneness. Listen to his prayer. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for people to be in partnership with him. Why? Maybe the better question is, how would you even know if that prayer got answered? Or what would it look like if it got answered? Well, what it would look like is this, so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's it. That's the whole reason and purpose for this partnership. Because unity is a huge draw for a world that is so disjointed, right? There's something about our unity that gives our message validity. There is so much division in our world around us. There's division in homes, there's division in, in schools, there's division in politics, there's division among races. Everywhere you look, we are so divided. Not here, not in the church. This should be the one place where there is true unity. This should be a city of refuge. This should be a place where there's beautiful harmony among Christians. This should be different because we're different. Jesus says, you're not like the world. The world's a soap opera, but this place, this place is special, and our unity can be a huge draw when people from the outside see what we have, we give them a front row seat to the grace of God. We show them what it means to be on the same page, not on the same page with each other, on the same page with God, and therefore on the same page with one another. They see our connection to the head and what that does for us and how it changes relationships, how it changes our lives. When people look at the church, they see something very different than the soap opera that's going on around them. In a world that is so divided and so disjointed, in a world that seems to be okay with that, a world that seems to promote this division, we promote something different. We promote unity and oneness for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom. We promote a connection to the head that affects our connection to other people. I want you to go back with me to the Garden of Eden. Look with me at verse 5 of Genesis chapter 2. 
It says, now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no one, no man, to cultivate the ground. Now skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend it. At least one of the purposes for man from the very beginning was to work. Which seems unusual to us because we tend to look at work as a dirty word. It's a four-letter word. Now, work intensified after the fall, but work is not a curse in and of itself. It was part of man's plan from the very beginning. It was part of God's purpose from the very beginning. Now, God gave Adam a partner, right? He gave him a helpmeet, a helper suitable to help him tend that garden. And God tells them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In essence, God says, take what I have given you and make the rest of the world look like that. Make it flourish and and be beautiful and provide for the needs of others. You know, we might could say that God was telling Adam and Eve to go into all the world and not mess it up. Of course, they did mess it up. But I bring all this up to make the point that God has always partnered with his people. Always. From the very beginning, he did it with Adam. And then after him, you see it with Moses, you see it with Noah, you see it with Abraham, you see it with David, on and on and on. You see that that God always partnered with his people. Do you know what we call this partnership, at least what the Old Testament calls it? New Testament too, it's called a covenant. When you partner with God, you enter into a covenant with him. Now understand that covenants are unilateral, okay? So we don't make covenants, only God does. At least we don't make covenants with God. We can make a covenant with somebody else, but the vertical relationship, only God makes the covenant. That's what it means to be unilateral. And if you look throughout the Bible, the reason covenants fail is not because of God. God is always faithful. Covenants fail because of you and me, because of people, because we don't obey the stipulations of the covenant. So man can be a covenant breaker. He cannot be a covenant maker, at least not with God. Only God can make the covenant. But it brings up the question, why? Why would he do it? Why would God choose to partner with imperfect people? He had to know that's a bad idea. God had to know in his foresight that it was a bad idea to partner with people. He had to see the the brokenness and the shame and the turmoil that that would cause. He had to know that it would hurt his heart. But for whatever reason, God has always wanted fellowship with his people. He has always wanted a special relationship with his people. That's what he wanted in the garden. When that failed, the rest of the Bible is a story about how God's trying to get that back. It's a story of redemption because God has always wanted to buy his people back. He has always wanted to restore that fellowship that was lost in the garden. God has always wanted a special relationship with his people. That's what a covenant is. That's what it means to partner with him. It's fellowship with a holy God. It's co-opting with God in his great mission. There's another legendary basketball coach by the name of John Wooden who said this, the man who puts the ball through the hoop has 10 hands. In other words, nobody does it by themselves. This is a team thing. And certainly that is the case with us. There are a whole bunch of hands involved in this. It's not just about you. It's about God and it's about how our vertical relationship affects the horizontal That's what it means to have fellowship. You know, we're all wrapped up, all tied up, and all tangled up in Jesus and with one another. At least we should be. Because that's what it means to be in partnership with one another. God has chosen to partner with us to tend his garden. Think of it that way. He has chosen to partner with us to tend his garden, more specifically to glorify him and to carry out his mission. So, here's the deal. God has given us a garden. What are we going to do with it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this church. 
What a blessing it is to be a part of Oldham Lane. What a blessing it is to be a part of your kingdom. God, may we show the world what unity looks like. May we exhibit that oneness in our daily lives as we glorify you in all that we do, including our relationships with others. May we always seek to be about you, to be about your business as we partner with you to advance the kingdom. Help us, God, as we strive to be more like Jesus and to win this fight. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Don's going to lead us in a song. If you need to make things right with God, if you need to make things right with someone else, remember, don't fool yourself into thinking that the vertical can be straight while the horizontal is crooked. It doesn't work that way. So before you take another step in worship, if you need to fix that, then fix it. Maybe you're ready to study the Bible with someone. Maybe you need prayer from this church family. Maybe you need support. Maybe you're ready to put on Christ in baptism. I don't know what your need is this morning, but I want you to know that this is a family ready to help you. So whatever it is, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing.